we have is Professor P. K. Katal. He is a professor of micropaleontology, Center of Advanced Study in Geology, Dr. Hari Singh Gaur, Central University, Sagar, Madhya Pradesh, India. He was the ex-head of applied geology for two terms and dean, School of Engineering and Technology. He chaired several sessions in international conferences in Canada, Austria, and India. He is a member of international and national academic societies. He is an associate editor of Journal of uh, Foraminiferal Research, USA, since 2015. He has a teaching experience of more than 38 years. He is the recipient of JSPS in 1999, as well as in 2003 to work in Japanese universities. He is also the recipient of that scholarship in 2007 to work in German universities. He authored the first two Indian textbooks on applied micropaleontology in the year 1998 and 2013. He has 45 papers in international journals. He has completed one research project under IGCB UNESCO and two under UGC. On behalf of ICPC 2020, we welcome you, sir, to give the keynote speaker. Uh, after listening to different talks on uh, use of planktonic foraminifera, I'm taking you to use of benthic foraminifera particularly. And uh, uh, I will be trying to throw some light on the oxygen minimum zones and how the discorbids and subsidies can be used for uh, demarcation of oxygen minimum zones with a case study on rotorboid granulosum. Uh, that might be useful in Indian hydrocarbon basin for oil exploration. Uh, the, the contents are including the concept and assumptions of paleoecological study. Actually, I was told that there will be uh, many students also participating in this event, and some basic things are to be discussed in the beginning. Then I will move on to the uh, detailed things uh, regarding the use of uh, benthic foraminifera, which I have named just now. And also I will deal with uh, citations of uh, work by others and how benthic foraminifera can be used in paleoclimatic, paleo temperature and paleo monsoonal studies. Uh, you see that uh, foraminifera, they are protozoans and uh, they are very susceptible to minute environmental changes. And these uh, changes in the environment are manifested by morphology and that we call as morphological tools. Sometimes these morphological tools help us saving a lot of our time in, in going into details of several analysis and direct uh, indications are found particularly in exploration projects. So they foraminifera may also proxy for uh, benthic foraminifera, I mean, for paleoclimatic, paleogeographic and paleoecological proxies. And uh, I will be talking more on the discorbids and sibicidides in this lecture and how they can be used in uh, demarcating low oxygen zone useful in oil exploration projects. You see here, uh, for paleoecology, uh, we know that uh, ecology uh, is uh, just a reciprocal relation among the organisms. And uh, we study the autoecology and scenicology on the basis of single species and the assemblage of species. And for every species, we know that the survival uh, range, growth range, and reproduction range for every parameter of environment they are different. For example, the illustration shows here that the temperature range of this particular species, the survival range is 20 to 40 degrees Celsius, and the growth range is from 25 to 35 degrees Celsius, but the reproduction range is between 28 to 30, 32 degrees Celsius. It means that uh, it will survive between 20 to 25, but it will not grow. And similarly, it will grow between 25 to 28, but will not reproduce in the paleoecology. But paleoecology cannot be simply understood by micropaleontology. We need to uh, take data from ecological, climatological, biological, and taphonomic uh, aspects. You see, the interpretations in paleoclimate using extinct species require certain assumptions. Uh, the organisms they adopt to res and restrict to a particular environment and a particular lifestyle and they depend upon other organisms directly or indirectly. And we can say that uniformitarianism is also applicable for inferences for ancient organisms and the environments based on the analogies that define in the present. If we move on to the benthic foraminifera, particularly their habitat, uh, we know that the benthic foraminifera, they occur in all depths from intertidal to 
uh, deep levels, all salinities from brackish to hypersaline and from all latitudes from equator to poles. Uh, benthic foraminifera in particular, uh, they may have adopted to one of the three uh, common habitats, epifaunal, infaunal, and deep infaunal. And the illustration shows here that the species, uh, uh, namely D1, B1, B2, and A3 are epifaunal, while D1, A1 uh, are semi-epifaunal. And there are two phytal species, B1 and A2. And the species D1 is infaunal, and deep below uh, 0.5 mm, everything is uh, deep infaunal. And uh, this is regarding the uh, concentration of uh, desired dissolved oxygen level for respiration and oxidation of organics range from 4 to 6 um, ml per liter. But it increases with increase in phytoplankton as Dr. Uh, Sinha was telling that uh, many plankton species are uh, thriving depending upon the phytoplanktons and some other on other zooplanktons. And uh, uh, foraminifera require dissolved oxygen at a very low concentration. But still there are certain species where the test spores, uh, particularly in faunal taxa, are inversely related to ambient bottom oxygen water. This I am citing Kohent in 2013 and 14. And the size of pore and openings can be variable on the basis of work done by the Modley and Hess in 1993. And the S2S produced by bacterial decay at deep bottom sediments make environment reducing and inhospitable for many species. Oxygen minimum zones that are also called as OMZs, they are the zones uh, varying in depth from 200 to 1,500 meters from latitude to latitude, and they are the zones of lowest concentration of oxygen. You see that uh, this zone here, uh, I am demarcating it with the red boundary, is uh, uh, the uh, low oxygen zone. And here in the op top side, we are showing you the uh, anthropogenically produced uh, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus contents. So we can say that uh, because the light is diminishing with the depth, uh, the uh, uh, photosynthesis is also going down, and therefore the oxygen level is uh, reducing. And uh, you can say that these zones are formed along continents of uh, western coast uh, of different continents by interplay of physical and biological process that create a pool of water where oxygen level falls to as low as uh, 2. And here, this uh, is very simple diagram where the upper photic zone and lower photic zone are shown, which are showing that how the oxygen level and is related to the photosynthesis. Here, this is the main thing of the talk that uh, ores and epifaunal species are uh, useful in uh, demarcating low oxygen zones. In fact, the two families, one is discorbidae and cbicidae, benthic foraminifera and some of them are adopted to low oxygen zone and actually they act as facultative anaerobes which means they can cope up with the low oxygen range by modifying their number and size of pores so uh, the uh, i am citing two studies one done by my group and i noticed it in the world virus granulosum in 1996 and again in 1998 and the pictures on the right hand side, we find that this is the dorsal side of the uh, species where number of pores are, large number of pores are there. And actually you can count the number of pores in, they are so large that you can e easily count them under a normal microscope. And when we enlarge them under my um, SEM, we find that they have a sieve plate over here. Uh, and uh, when we use computer stimulation, adopt Photoshop, we can actually count the number of pores in the sieve and this and these number of pores, size and pores of the main pore and the sieve, they are depending upon the concentration of oxygen. So they have been taken as a morphological tool or rather on the basis of pore density and pore size in case of uh, rotor virus granulosum. Then uh, uh, there is another uh, study con which is uh, which confirms the findings made by Rathman. Uh, it was published in Nature in 2018 on the basis of Cibicidis versus Torfi. And the, the figures down below, A is showing you a lot of perforation, but the B is the other side, uh, the ventral side, where there are no perforation. And when they gave same uh, computer stimulation using Adobe Photoshop, they can actually count the number of pores and they related it with the uh, level of oxygen.
You see, this is the case study. It was published in 1996 in Review of Paleobiology. And here we found that uh, this Rotorboidus granulosum is uh, one um, species of Atlantic Ocean, the opening between the two North America and South America that, that uh, uh, Panamian Sea Way was open at the time. And uh, it was recorded by Matoba and Yamaguchi that uh, this uh, Gulf was uh, a proto Gulf of California was uh, a very low oxygen since its existence later. And you see here, this is the migration trend of uh, Rotor Virus granulosum from the Atlantic Ocean uh, uh, crossing the North American and South American Seaway, which was open before Middle Miocene, and entering into the o Indian Ocean. And then we find it uh, along the east coast of India between North 9 and 10. A number of Rotor Virus living species are there. And this is the place. I go back to the, uh, the last slide, and here we find that the um, uh, Proto Gulf of California in the early to middle Miocene was existing. And uh, this is the walk by uh, Rathbone, and uh, I will uh, simply uh, give a little uh, citation that this new proxy is based on species that are widely distributed geographically, bathymetrically, and chronologically. And the calibration demonstrates that the poor surface area of fossil epifaunal benthic foraminifera can be used to reconstruct past changes in the deep ocean oxygen and redox level, I unquote. You see here, uh, I am demonstrating you the use of rotor virus granulosum in oil exploration. In fact, wherever we find increase in hydrogen sulfide due to bacterial decay in deep bottom and also in the shallow seas, we find that environment becomes reducing and inhospitable for most of these species. But these are certain zones where these facultative scorbis and subsidides may live. And if we can demarcate these zones on the basis of these morphological tools depicting the size and number of perforation, we can call them these are oxygen minimum zones. So we can recognize rotor virus granulosum zone. Uh, uh, representing the oxygen minimum zones for identification of source rock for hydrocarbon exploration. And uh, it uh, this rotor virus granulosum is occurring in tertiary rocks in India. And uh, illustration shows that uh, these are the three lithologs where the concentration of uh, rotor virus granulosum has been marked as a oxygen minimum zone. And it will be helpful in the demarcation of uh, these zones not only demarcation, but correlation in the basin, which is required in hydrocarbon exploration. Foraminifera can be uh, used as proxy for paleoclimatic reconstruction in otherwise manner also. Uh, here, uh, this is on the basis of uh, uh, pancreatic foraminifera, a well-known work, uh, but just I'm displaying that the isothermal map of polar region has been based on the coiling direction of pancreatic foraminifera. Uh, there are certain species, particularly Globizarina pachyderma and Globorotalia tranquitolinitis, which show sinistral coiling up to 5 degrees Celsius in the southern hemisphere. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, above 5 degrees Celsius zone, they show dextral coiling. Similarly, in the northern hemisphere, again, they are showing. So these are certain sets of which species. This work is based on Armstrong and Brazer, 2002. And uh, uh, we can also use uh, uh, foraminifera, benthic foraminifera, as proxy for paleo monsoonal study, studies. I'm citing work by Manessa and Nigam that was carried uh, way back in 1992. Uh, in fact, Nigam in 1992 used a percentage distribution of two morphological forms. Uh, one is rounded symmetrical form for higher rainfall. And it was in the beginning of uh, when people started talking about the paleo monsoonal precipitation, these, this work was done. So I thought it should be included. And more angular symmetrical forms for poor monsoon. And uh, Manessa et al. also found that the morphology helps in interpretation of paleo monsoonal precipitation uh, in the way that elongated forms belong to calm water conditions, while the rounded forms belong to agitated water condition which are uh, indicating high aeration. This uh, high aeration zone is again useful. Chances of transformation of organic matter into oil are um, their minimum. So the, these parameters uh, are not only useful in 
um, value mansural precipitation study, but also in exploration studies. You see, this, these are the two pictures I'm citing from the work done by Nigam, and this is just to simplify how the microenvironment, progression of microenvironment can be used in understanding the paleo monsoon. You see the waterfront over here. This is the waterfront. Uh, uh, the river is uh, meeting the ocean, and this is the sediment front, which is limited to the river mouth. But uh, if the rains are rigorous or the spell is rigorous, then we find that this front is proceeding more towards the ocean side. So in a log, if we find that this front is re retreating back, towards the uh, river mouth that indicates poor spell of monsoon, but if it is forwards, seawards, it is indicating high monsoon. The same is shown by this cartoon. You see river is flowing and uh, this uh, blue zone is showing the sediment front, which is a normal front. Uh, when the rainfall is normal or deficient, if it is retreating back, it is deficient. But if the rainfall is more and uh, the fan is extended, then uh, it could uh, uh, it could attain the outer side, and this shows the enhanced um, precipitation. See, this I have taken a river from South China Sea. This is Changlian River, which is showing uh, clearly showing the uh, sediment front and the mixing of sediments with the water. And this blue line progression is. Uh, the um, the inner uh, river front, but uh, if there is if there's a lot of uh, rains, then we find that this front is increasing as demarcated by the uh, red perimeter. And uh, this is how the uh, actually the model has been uh, perceived. Uh, and this is again the study done by NIO in the early days uh, based on uh, workers, uh, namely Nigam and Kare and others. And they have used three parameters. One is angular asymmetrical form of benthic foraminifera and a number of uh, uh, total benthic foraminifera. And the third parameter they took is the number of total benthic foraminifera. And they have drawn three curves uh, and uh, uh, they have uh, tried to infer the dry spells uh, I, that I'm going to show by the progression of arrows in the slide. You see, this is the time 19. Uh, 1580, and then uh, uh, this arrow is showing all these. You see, all the three parameters are giving. Uh, ha they are showing harmony in in indicating the dry spells. So the another uh, and this the second arrow is showing dry spell during 1800 BP, and the next one is showing the dry spell around 3000 BP. Then the other one is showing 3500 BP. 2,790 BP, 4,050 BP, and 4,380 BP. We find that the cyclicity is seen more in the lower side of the core, but uh, in the upper side, in the last 200 years, uh, the, the, the interval between the cycle of uh, dry spill is not that consistent. But this is how the paleo uh, monsoonal study started and they have assumed the dimension that we have listened. So in this way, we can say that the benthic foraminifera are also quite useful in understanding the paleoclimate. They can be used as proxy. They can save our time in so many uh, tedious uh, uh, analysis by developing MARFO tools, which are useful and uh, can be done in a simple way. Uh, so with this, I thank my audience for uh, this uh, uh, lecture thank you very much i want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to deliver talk uh, before the international audience thank you very much